Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Electronics Bash Fundamentals of Electronics and Arduino and Raspberry Pi and Programming and Python stream. I'm Jeff. It's good to see you all again on a Sunday night. Hey, Nate. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you here last week for a, sl a slightly more structured week than last week. Um, I had a, a a fun time doing the like casual work we did last weekend on the um, uh, on the RAM integration with Arduino and like the CRT display, but it was very loosey goosey, um, which is kind of the point of it, I guess. But did feel a little bit like what happened for the past three hours when it was all said and done. In any case, tonight we're going to do something a little bit more structured. We're going to talk about uh, basic graphical user interfaces in. Uh, Python and was specifically using the tkinter library for our Raspberry Pi uh, like we've been um, programming in for the past few weeks, months, I don't know, time is a construct. Um, yeah, as always, I, I haven't even started the timer today because we'll probably jump in pretty quickly. Um, the only thing I have to say is, uh, man, it has been a bit of a week, I think we'll all agree. Um, for uh, for me, that's meant that last night I did not get very much sleep, and then I took what I what we call in our household a disaster nap, which is a nap that you don't mean to take, and which causes the rest of your day's schedule to be a bit of a disaster. So, uh, if I seem a little bit loopy tonight, that's why. You might say I'm a bit of a crispy boy <laughs> from Alarmist Brewing Company here in Chicago, which I'm drinking, which is a tasty pilsner uh, that I'll be enjoying over the course of the evening. I was talking about good things. I hope... You are all doing well. I hope you are all staying safe out there in uh, what continue to be tumultuous times. Um, but uh, for my sake, a little bit a little bit of weight is off my shoulders having passed the major events uh, of this past week. At least we hope so. Um, so I hope we're all still hydrating and washing our hands and all that good stuff um, as we move forward into future challenges. Yeah? Speaking of future challenges, should we just get into it tonight? I feel like in some ways like the timer was helpful for like getting me started on time. And in some ways it was holding us back. So I think we'll just dive in. Let's just do it. Um, yeah, as always, shout out questions if you got them, send them comments if you want them. Uh, but we'll just start talking about graphical user interfaces. As always, all of the code that is pre-written for tonight and all of the slides, well, I should say, all of the slides, which this week is none. No slides this week. It's such a graphical presentation. It's such an interactive one. I didn't even bother to make slides. We're going to do it all on the screen. But all of the code that we've pre-written is on the website, jeff.glass slash electronics bash. Uh, and you can check it out there if you want to follow along. And this is one of the weeks that I recommend that you do um, because it's one of the best ways of becoming more acquainted with the tkinter library and the tk library um, and what it can do is just to play around with the various aspects of it um, and what all the things are um, uh, for a little bit of backstory so this is the library that we'll be working with tonight it's called tkinter t-k-i-n-t-e-r it is almost certainly uh, installed already in your installation of thani if you're working in the thani ide on your raspberry pi like we have been um, if not you can uh, search for, let's see, what is it installed under in PyPy? TK. No, that's TensorKit. We wouldn't want that. Uh, let's see, what is it actually installed as? Tempty. I'm not sure it's under TCL. In any case, if you install, yes, TCL would also be fine. Um, but like I say, it is pretty standard, so I would be surprised if you had to install it manually. Um, so let's get into how it works. I'm going to start making things with it. Um, after this very first example, it'll become clear a little bit more what a graphical user interface for a program in Python looks like. Because you're like, I don't even know what we're talking about tonight. It'll start to make more sense in just a second here. Um, also, a little side note, if, um, if the music volume is too loud, uh, the newest version of OBS kind of messed with some audio settings. So I can't tell if the music is just loud for me or for everyone. I'm actually going to drop it a few notches just now because it seems a little loud. But I honestly don't know. So let me know how it goes. All right, back to T. Kinter. Good evening, Palmer, and maybe Katie as well. Nice to see you. I don't know. I, I'm waving at the chat window, even though you are over there. I'm so sorry. Uh, hi, Kai Palmer and Katie in the chat in the chat window. Didn't know there was music playing. Yeah, very strange. Ooh, and now my. Mic gain is maybe clipping. Let me turn that down a little bit. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so let's just get into it. Um, this this uh, very first program is only nine lines long. It is, of course, on the website as well. It's a good framework for getting started with a graphical user interface. 
um, we're just gonna first import the whole tkinter library and we're gonna bring it in. This is a, a pretty standard thing that people seem to do when they're writing programs in tkinter is because we're gonna need to refer to components of this library very, very often. Uh, it's nice to shorten this name as much as possible, honestly, just for convenience. So we're gonna say import tkinter as tk. So then later on, we won't have to say something like tkinter.button. We can just say, hey, we've renamed that to tk.button. It just saves a little space. You could just say import tkinter, and then everywhere that we've seen tk in the code that will come, you could say tkinter, but it's awfully nice just to like, it it's maybe seems silly, but like the number of times we're gonna have to type out one of these things makes it worth saving those five letters. Cool. So um, here, let me run this code, and then I can show you a little bit about um, why it's doing what it is. So running that little bit of code created this free floating window here. You can see it's called a TK window, although we can change that title later. Um, this is gonna be like the basic building block of our interface programs. I can resize it, I can minimize it, I can close it. We get all that functionality for free, super awesome. And here's how we do. One of the most basic components of the tkinter library is the frame object. And we'll go into more detail about exactly what the frame object is later. Um, but the basics of how we're going to, the, the frame is basically a, a container for other objects, a, a blank screen, if you will. This sort of open rectangular area that we can put, we will be putting text and buttons and other interface options inside of. So in order to start messing with it, what we're going to do is something we talked about last time and extend the tk.frame object, this frame object, and say, hey, I'm gonna make a, an object that is a type of frame with some own additional parameters here. You'll remember this from last time when we talked about um, object-oriented programming in classes that we had, uh, you know, when we have my class and it extends uh, some other class, we get all of the methods, all the functions and all the properties of this other class for free. And then anything that we add to it will be in addition to those. So this is basically saying, hey, I want to start with just, you know, basically this is saying, I'm creating a new class called app, although I could call it anything. Um, and it's going to be uh, going to be a type of frame with some additional stuff I'm going to add in here. Although, of course, right now I just have this pass statement, which you'll recall means just do nothing. Right? I just need something here for parsing sake. But right now, and the app is a frame and and nothing more. We'll come down here and show how we get that frame displaying on the window. I couldn't remember. Have we? A time is so slippery these days. I can't remember if we've talked about this construction before. I feel like we have the if na underscore underscore name equals main. Um, the gist of it is that this is a way to ensure that the code inside of this function only runs when we are directly executing this particular file. Um, the name variable stores the name of the file that code is executing in, right? So normally we'd think that this would be, this name variable if you're running here would be called tk underscore hello world because that's the name of my Python file. But for a very special case, when you run a file in Python directly, like when I hit this, you know, run current script button or I press F5 on my keyboard, this name variable gets set to underscore underscore main underscore underscore. And so this is just a really easy way of saying, hey, is, is this file being executed directly versus have I included it via an import statement into some other bit of code? If I'm running it directly, I want to, you know, do some things down here to start up a window. If I'm not running it directly, if this is being included into some other body of code that I'm, you know, I, maybe I have a code base that occasionally I'm going to want to, you know, open one of these windows to do something, to change some settings, to make some changes, and then close it again. In that case, this name parameter will be the file name, and this code won't run. So when you're writing code, it can be a good practice to say to write all your classes and your functions uh, in the normal bit of code, and then things that you want to sort of execute to start things off, you put inside of this if name equals main construct. A little bit of a tangent. I feel like we've talked about it before. I might be insane or maybe both. Um, so to get our, our, uh, our window started here, our graphical user interface, we will need a, a variable to hold the name of our, to hold our object. Our object will be of type app, right? Which is the class that I defined above. And when you're in initializing uh, a, uh, a frame or really any object in tkinter. And like I say, we'll go a little bit, we'll go deeper into all of this. I just want to get us started with the basic framework. You give the object the parent object that it should inherit from. 
in this case, that object is the TK, the, the TK object, which is sort of the, the base rock on which all of the other functionality is built. So later on, when we are adding things to frames, right, just to make up a little code, I could say, and we'll, we'll go into more detail, I could say something like my button equals TK dot button, and I would have to give it, uh, perhaps this button is living inside of my uh, options frame. Uh, and then some other options that would come out here, right? So this first object that I'm going to give it is going to be the parent object that this one nestles inside. And again, if that doesn't make sense, it will in just a moment. Um, so we, we say that, hey, my my main object here, my app object, is a child of the big TK object, the VTK window that we're creating. Uh, and once I've created it, I would like to start it running its main loop. Um, and the app.main loop function is going to do a lot of things for us. It's basically going to tell the TK library to do all of the behaviors that we want it to do. If we click a button, things might want to happen. If we have things running on timers or changing background colors, we need to have like mouse interactivity. It handles all that for us under the screen. Um, so the, the gist of it is we instantiate a variable that is a, uh, that we, we give it, we say, hey, this is our bedrock object. Please do this as your parent and then start things rolling. So when we run that, we get our empty window with nothing in it, which is not terribly exciting. I will be the first to admit. Um, so let's, uh, Let's add some objects to it. So a lot of a lot of tonight, we're gonna to do some hands-on demos. We're gonna see how we can interact with hardware. But a lot of this is just gonna be like, hey, here's a slew of interface objects that you can use and interact interact with them. Um, and uh, the 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 ultimate punchline will be, I think one of the last uh, bits of code that's listed on the website is called lots of widgets. Is basically, and I don't know that it's all, but it's most of the interaction widgets that you can use in the TK interlibrary. So if you're looking later, if you're watching this later on, you're like, I would really just love to see like a big display of everything I could cram into my program. The lots of widgets uh, code example on the website is a good place to start. So let's add some things to our code here. Um, and a good way to do this is when we, basically when I initialize my window, I would like it to not just be an empty window, I'd like to stuff some stuff inside of it. So when we initialize our window, I'd love to, to put some stuff inside it right away, and we'll do that inside of our init method. And we talked about this last time too. This is the actual function that's being called when you use this construction. When you say, you know, my app is an app, uh, an app, an instance of the app class, given these parameters, what this is doing is actually just calling this internal function. The same thing when we had like red LED equals LED 20 from the GPIO zero library, this would call the init method of the LED class in that library. So now that we're going to sort of be modifying what things happen when we start up our app, when we instantiate our app object, we need to be modifying our init method. So for the moment, we'll just say uh, it doesn't take any particularly special variables, but as always, it takes the self variable. Um, and the first thing I want to do is, and we talked about this last time as well, uh, we super dot init self, yes, um, is call the init method for tk dot frame. So when we call this initialize method, uh, the first thing I want to do is say, hey, anything that this frame object that we're going to pretend to be a type of, anything that we're a type, we want to do that first. So I want to get the get the tk dot frame class and run its init method, and that's going to do whatever tkinter is doing under the hood to set us up for success with these frames. It's probably going to allocate some memory. It might set some default parameters. Um, I don't really know or, or care, um, but I do want to make sure that I run that initializer as soon as my code starts, so we get set up with all of that. And then in the rest of this init function, we can start putting objects into our frame and having them appear on screen. So. Let's put some stuff on screen. Um, the simplest object, I think, uh, is the label object. We'll create a new object called my label, and then it's of type tk.label. Um, like I said before, uh, every object in tkinter needs a parent object or what it's going to sit underneath or inside. In this case, um, my parent object is going to be the app class itself, is going to be uh, this this empty frame, this app frame that we've created by initializing a an app class here, um, that's this whole overall thing is what I want to be my parent object. I want to be creating things inside of here. So my label is going to take the app itself as its parent object. And it has many parameters that you can give it, but in this case, uh, I'm going to give it the text parameter with a value, this is a label. 
Now I've created that, but I still don't have anything on screen here. I just have a blank window. And that's because we haven't told our app yet where to place this label object within this window. There are a couple different methods of telling um, telling Tkinter where to place a new object. Um, the simplest one is called pack. Um, oops. I have an error here. And it takes one positional argument, but two were given. I have an error. Ah, uh -huh. So what it's telling me here is that I passed in an argument to this function. Um, I said, hey, uh, make an app with the parent TK, uh, the, the TK object, but I didn't have any place for that TK object to go up here. Um, I need to make sure that I capture that master object and pass it along to the frame initializer up there. Oop, app has no attribute TK. Where have I got my error now? Good, troubleshooting. Uh, let's see. TK, oh, uh, I think this is probably, I do not need the self there. Yeah, there we go. And let's run that one more time. I get a window, but I get no label. Ah, I know what's happening here. I did this in troubleshooting too. So much in the same way that I need to tell my label where it's going to be inside of my app class. Um, and by pack just basically says, hey, just stick it in there, right? Get it in there. Uh, I'm not going to be real specific about where. I also need to tell my frame to pack itself within the root object, this big TK object. So at the end of my initialization, after I've crammed everything that I want to inside of my, my frame, I need to tell the frame itself to get inside of the TK object. And now we see, hey, isn't that cute? I have a label. This is a label. It's a label. It's probably a little small and hard to see, but I swear it's a label. Um, let's make another one. I'll say uh, my second label equals TK.label. Again, its parent object is going to be the whole frame and it te its text is going to be another label. And again, we'll say my second label dot pack. And when we execute this code, we'll see we should have two labels. <laughs> this is a label and another label, um, one just below another. So pack by default just crams each successive thing you pack underneath the previous one. What we might call, so this is a little, um, a little term of art that you sometimes see in graphical user interface programming, depending on your, uh, your library environment, you certainly see it in Tkinter. Um, rather than using above or below or left or right of, um, particularly above and below often means screen direction, but sometimes, you know, you might say that like the, the child, if you have a child object and a parent object, that in some sense the child object is underneath or below the parent object. Like you sort of mix those metaphors a little bit, which isn't great. So a common convention is to say, rather than saying this another label is below, this is a label, we say it's south of this is a label. Um, we could say it's west or east of that label, just so we have some like different terminology to refer to screen direction, rather than referring to some other concepts that might reuse the terms above and below. Quick questions? You who've been here a while know, know what that means. Nice light fall pills. Um, so labels are all well and good. I'm actually going to go to my cheat sheet a little bit here. Remember what I meant to talk about next. This might be a good time to just show off what, if you were to go to jeff.glass slash electronics bash, what you would see there. <laughs> um, it's a list of all of the code for this week, in which case, in this case, it's going to be a, a nice reminder of what I intended to do in what order. Talk about labels. Oh yeah. Let's talk about buttons. That will be, that'll be fun. Oh, now we're back over here. That's great. Oops. And I'm going to make sure I am on live chat. There we go. So I don't miss anything. So let's add some clickable buttons to our, uh, our not very good app. I mean, I think you'll agree this is not a particularly fancy user interface. We will also blow the font size up in a little bit here um, just to make things a little bit easier to see. But just so you see what the default does when you sort of run these first bits of code. Um, we'll leave our first and second labels there and let's create a clickable button. Um, so we'll say my butt equals tk.button. We'll create a... Uh, a button object. Palmer says, I also use my website as a reference to my past life, right? It's like one of the things that I find most valuable about like writing a blog or making these pages is like having it as a reference for later. It's like, what the heck did I do there? Um, so our button will be a child of the whole window itself. Um, the button can also have text. We'll say, 
uh, click me will be our button text. Um, and like before, we'll say my butt dot pack. We'll run that and we should have, now we have a label, a label and a clickable button. Now the button is clickable by default, but it doesn't actually, I mean, it doesn't do anything. It's like, there's a little, you know, animation. And this is one of the nice things about Tkinter. You get this, you know, if I mouse over it, I get a nice highlight. If I click it, it depresses and then comes back. Like you get all of this nice behavior for free. Um, but of course it would be nicer if the behavior we had was that it, you know, actually did something. So let me show you how to do something with clickable buttons in Tkinter. Um, first, let's create a function for the thing we want to do. Um, let's call it uh, button clicked. And we'll say it takes no parameters. So we'll just, as always, we'll have this little self hanging out in our parameters there. Uh, and when we when we click this button, let's say just to start, it we'll say uh, print out you clicked the button, right? <laughs> Not a terribly exciting thing to happen, but just to like show that something is happening, right? Now to get this function to execute when we click the button, here is our syntax. Inside of our button constructor, I will say you know text equals click me command equals self dot button clicked. And you'll notice that I'm not putting our clothes parentheses here like we're used to seeing. Ooh, I messed up the formatting there. Self.button clicked. I'm not putting these closed parentheses here because I don't want to necessarily execute the function at the point where I'm getting to this line of code. I want to give this button the name of the function that it's going to execute when I click it. So I say, okay, command store a reference to this function. And when I click you, then go out and actually call that function. So if I run this code now, I still have my same, I have my labels, a label and click me. But now if I hit click me, I get you click the button, click again, you click the button, you click the button, you click the button. Tremendous, right? And I can have multiple buttons doing multiple things. I could say uh, my second butt equals tk.button, text equals um, don't click me, uh, and command equals self.don't. And we'll write that in a moment here. And we'll say my second butt.pack. Sorry, I'm like, I'm four years old tonight, apparently. The, the, <laughs> having a class called my, a variable called my butt gives me great joy. Um, so let's write this don't command here um, that we wrote earlier. We'll say def uh, don't. And again, we'll take no parameters. We'll say you shouldn't have clicked the button. Uh, so now if I run this code and everything's packed in, I have two buttons, uh, click me and don't click me. As before, if I click, click me, I get you click the button. If I click, don't click me, you shouldn't have clicked the button. So we see each time we, we click one of these buttons, we're running the function whose name we've given it. And remember, if there's, there should not be parentheses here. Let's see what error it gives us if we do. Yeah, so you'll see I didn't click anything, but the moment that this program loaded, it ran the function don't. And if I click this button, nothing happens. And that's because this command was saying, okay, I, I'm gonna, I'm getting here, I'm expecting the name of a function. Maybe by running this function, it'll give me the name of a function. And so it runs it, it does its, what it's supposed to do, it prints it out, and then it doesn't have anything else to do later. So you do not want to have parentheses here in your, in your reference to what command you're running when you're running a button. Um, it might be nice for this don't click me button to be a slightly different color. So maybe this is a good time to talk about um, configuring other parameters of uh, the tkinter objects. A lot of the objects have a, a very similar set of parameters, foreground color, background color, um, padding around the sides, that kind of thing. Um, one of the ones I use the most often is background color. So you can use this config method on any of your tkinter objects, and it takes a variety of parameters. Um, the background, which I think you can actually just type out as background or the shorthand is BG, and then you can give it a color. I wonder, I don't remember if TK supports, yeah. Uh -huh. So it supports a variety of um, named colors, right? So now our, our don't click me button is red. Maybe we'll, uh, Maybe we'll make my, let's see, something strange is going on with the formatting here. There we go. Maybe I'll make my first button. I'll say my butt.config bg equals green, just to encourage people to click it. So you can use a variety of these named colors uh, as like, as colors you can use. You can also use hexadecimal colors like you'd use in the web. So maybe that green is too dark for me. In this case, I'm going to use a pound sign to start off the hexadecimal color. And then I get two hex digits for red, for green, and for blue in that order. If you've done any playing around with like web colors, you're probably familiar with this kind of syntax. Um, but for example, if I wanted this to be quite green and just a little bit red and a little bit blue, I might say, 
okay, so my first bite is hex red. So that's going to see a little bit of red, let's say AA, then green, and then blue. And then maybe down here for my red, I want a lot of red, a little green, and a little blue. Run that. Now we see we have some, some slightly nicer pastel-y colors here. And we still have that nice mouse over behavior um, as well. And they, the buttons, of course, behave as they did before. I get click me and don't click me as... Um, as we click our two buttons here. Now these functions, of course, could do a lot of other things, um, but in our case, they're just printing some things out uh, so that we can we can see that they're being clicked. Might be nice at this point in the night to um, to make our font a little bit bigger, just, just for the sake of, I imagine it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here over the internet. I mean, maybe the colors are helping, um, but let's, let's blow the font size up a little bit here. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna need to bring in, or I'm, I'm gonna choose to bring in, um, uh, the tkinter.font sub module. So this is a subset of tkinter. And I'm gonna bring that in as tkf. Um, and actually, while I do, um, this will be very similar to the font example on the website. So I'm just gonna double check what my initialization is here, because that's part of the point of me doing these things ahead of time is that I get them right <laughs> in real time. Um, so before I start instantiating any objects in my code now, why don't I create a uh, a new font object by saying, rather than just saying tk.label, tk.button, right, because these are sort of primary objects within the tk class, um, I'm going to use a tkf.font, a sub-object of the tkinter font class. Ah, hi, Chris, how are you? Chris has a question. Are hover colors adjustable as well and the on-click color? I think they are. Let me show you how we'll find out so we know how to look at that a little bit more. Um. So let's see, I'm gonna go to tkinter effbot. There's lots of good tkinter references on the web. The one at effbot, effbot.org is one of my favorites. Um, and let's go to the button widget page. That'll be our reference here. And we'll scroll down until we see, yes, our various options. So let's see. So I've been using the background parameter here, the default background. Let's look and see um, if, uh, background, foreground, highlight, background color, highlight color. Color to use for the highlight border when the button has focus. Here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see a little better. This highlight color parameter, um, which doesn't seem quite like the thing. Pad X, pad Y, relief, take focus, underline, flash. Well, let's play with a couple of these because honestly, I have not... Um, I've not tried this before. Let's try setting the highlight color parameter and seeing what that does. Uh, let's, so we'll do uh, mybutt.config highlight color equals, so this is gonna be our green button. So let's say when it's highlighted, ideally it would turn uh, very green. So we'll reduce the amount of red and blue. Let's see what that does. So it uh, doesn't seem to be, this might be for Ah, okay, so what that I think is changing is it's a little, it's going to be really hard for you to see here, but I'm tabbing between the two buttons. The black, the red button there is getting a black background, and the green button here is getting this highlight color button that I specified, sort of a, a darker green background. So it's not highlight color. Um, let's see, foreground, default, compound. Ah, what color to use when the button is active? Active background. Let's try that. Hopefully this isn't too far off the beaten path, but um, but I think this is a, a good kind of question to show like what to do to look for these answers. Ah, yeah, so that's the parameter. So you'll see now, and here, let me make this a little bit more distinct still. We'll make this uh, like 33FF33, run that again. And so this active background color is the color, the, according to the documentation, is the color that the background is when the button is active, which in this case seems to mean when it's moused over. So now when I mouse over red, it's defaulting to that light gray. When I mouse over this green, it's giving me this nice bright electric green that I just specified. So, so yes, Chris, the answer I suppose is yes. Uh, the on-click color, let's see. Um, Let's see. Oh, I guess I didn't click anything there. Let's see what happens when I click those buttons. Uh, yeah, it looks like the the uh, mouse over color and the clicked color. Although I think you may be able to change the style. Like you can see it's it's kind of depressing there. Not depressing, but depressing as I click it. I think you can adjust that as well. Um, 
by playing around in some of those options? Good question. Always a good question. Always, always happy. I, th I think you know this about me now, but I'm always happy to take a question that's like, hey, can we try this? I love it. Because uh, I usually find things like, I've never tried that, but I'll, it feels like there should be. And then we go and find it. Or we don't find it in three minutes and we go on. <laughs> but that's how these things go. <laughs> All right. We were in the process of blowing up the font size. Here, we'll leave that nice, that crisp color that we had there. Um, so I'm going to create this a font object, which is a, a sub-module, not of the main tkinter, but of tk.font. Um, and I'm going to make it a member of a certain font family. And you can look all these up in the documentation. There's some serif and some sans serif, and then you give it a font size. And then you can pass um, this as an object. We'll say uh, my font equals tkf.font equals this. I can pass this font object as a parameter called font to any of my tkinter objects. So I'd say font is equal to my font that I created up here. When I run this, or my first label is now in 30 point font hanging out on my screen. Similarly, let's just apply that to all of my other objects here to make them a little bit easier to see. Some of these will start drifting off the edge of my, uh, my, my uh, programming interface here, but we can always scroll over to them when we need them. Run that, and now we have a nice, this is a label, another label. Don't click me. Should not have clicked the button. But maybe maybe we'll work in something like this font size until we run out of room, just to make things a little bit easier to see here. Um, you, of course, can have more than one font. Right? I can say my small font equals tkf.font family equals lucida grande size equals 20, right? And maybe my labels want to be big, but my buttons want to use font equals my small font, my small font. And now when I compile that, my labels are big and my fonts are smaller. So you could have, you know, you could have an individual font for every single object on your screen. I personally think that two or three font sizes is plenty to sort of differentiate other things that are happening on your screen, but this is not, I think it's becoming clear, not a user interface design stream, it's a tkinter stream. So you do you. All right, so that is fonts. Let's check my cheat sheet for what comes next. Ah, so um, this is a way, so we've been sort of manually creating a couple of buttons here and setting their parameters, but it is often useful to, um, you know, create a uh, a slew of buttons at once. And this is kind of a cumbersome, you know, two or three lines of code per button. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say I wanted to create a program for uh, my employees to log in with very simply on a touchscreen when they get to work each day. By the way, that's probably the kind of thing that you want to like delegate to a payroll company because if you screw that up, big problems. But for the sake of example, um, let's say, and we'll just tack this onto our existing program. Let's make a list of our employees, and it will be uh, Nate, Palmer, Chris, Mary, Jeff, um, and Kenneth, who has not logged in today, I don't think. And we'll just, you know, we'll mark him absent. Um, so it'd be nice if I could have a button on screen for each of these six people. So they, you walk up, you touch your name, and then you, you know, hit log in or something like that. Um, I could go through and say, uh, you know, Nate button equals TK dot button. Uh, it's going to be a parent of the full object. Text equals Nate. Like this is one way that I could go through. I could go and create all of my six objects individually. Um, but what if I add new employees? What if I need to remove some employees? And either way, that's kind of a cumbersome way of doing it. So let us let me show you uh, an easy way. Who's the CEO? Uh, I mean, I think I'm the, I'd am the. be like the media officer in this situation, like the communications officer. Um, I, it seems there's probably like a power struggle going on in this situation. Um, so <laughs> Chris, you blew my mind apart with that question. What are we talking about? Oh, buttons. Um, so let me show you like a, a quick structure for creating a button for each of the objects in a list, which is a really useful thing to do. And we'll use it a little bit later as well. Um, so rather than going through and individually creating a variable to be each of these buttons, uh, I'll do this as you might expect in a loop. I'll say for emp in employees, right? And this is just our way of looping over all of the objects of this loop. I'll say uh, button is a button object parent of the overall child object. Actually, in fact, let's use this example to learn something else as well. Let's create a new frame. We'll say employee frame equals tk.frame, and it's going to be a parent of the overall 
uh, frame object that is our program. And in this case, our employees will be a child not of the overall frame, but of this new frame we've created now. Now, why might we want to do this? Well, um, well, let's let's finish this out, and I think we'll see why. So we'll make a button product of the employee frame. Text is equal to uh, the employee's name. Uh, and then we will pack that into the frame. And once everybody's packed in, we need to remember to pack this new frame we've created back into the overall program. So now we have Nate, Palmer, Chris, Mary, Jeff, Kenneth, all in a, a clickable line down the edge of our program here. And uh, let's, uh, for all of these, we'll say that the font equals my small font, just so we can see a little bit better there. So now, rather than having to create each of these buttons one by one with their own little bit of code, I'm just saying, okay, for every employee in my list, create a button uh, with the text equal to the employee and then pack it into my new frame. Then for the next employee, so make a Nate button, pack it in, make a Palmer button, pack it in, and so on. And that packs our buttons nicely into our, into our app here. Um, the advantage of putting these in their own frame rather than sticking them, you know, just sort of as children of the overall um, uh, the overall window, if you will, is that I can now, like, A, sort of treat the parameters of that frame separately from the overall frame. So I, let's say I want this employee area to be set apart a little bit differently. I could say employee frame .config, uh, bg equals uh, green. Right? And now just like my other objects, ooh, although that's pretty hideous. <laughs> We can see it sort of highlighted the named area here um, to sort of draw focus to it. So when our employees log in, they're like, oh, yeah, I need to go down here and click on my name as I log in. Um, this is also probably a good time, this as a side note, to mention um, how we can solve this problem of the fact like the frame, you can tell here, is only as sort of wide and tall as it needs to be. So this green area represents the wholeness of my little employee frame that exists within the big frame that is my program. And you can see it's been stretched out this wide just because the Kenneth button is that wide, and it's exactly as tall as, uh, as the buttons are tall. What I'd really like is for this to expand out to the full width of the window. Um, just so that it like it looks a little bit cleaner here. And there's an easy enough way to do that. In our pack method here, our pack method will take a few parameters if we want to give them. Um, we can say fill equals tk.x. Um, and this is saying, so within the tk library, in addition to classes, there's also a few constants um, that mean special things to the program. So in this case, I'm just saying, hey, you know, you have this, the tk library has this idea of what fill in the x direction means represented by this x parameter. So my fill is going to be uh, in the x direction and I'm going to say expand equals one, which in this case means expand to 100% of the available space of your window. So now that frame is filling all of the space in the X direction that it can. And as I resize the window, it's expanding. It should expand. Oh, it's not expanding. <laughs> well, that's a shame. Oh, you know what it is? Aha, okay. So this is one of those gotchas about uh, working with frames in the TK library. So what looks like is happening here is that our employee frame is not expanding to fill the screen. But I think what is happening is that our uh, our main frame, our app, is, which is sort of bounded along this invisible line that we can't see here, is not expanding to fill the window. I think we can prove that actually by um, making our actual, our full giant frame, uh, a slightly different color than the background. We'll say, uh, let's make this a, 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 and a pound sign there, right? And I run this, so I've, I've changed the background. Yeah, aha, uh -huh. so now when I expand this, we'll see. So this, this inner gray area is the extent of my app class. Uh, it's being overwritten by my my green frame here. It's stretching to fill all of that space. But my my frame, my big frame, my app frame is not expanding to fill the window. Um, so what I need to do is do self.config. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, I do it in the pack method. So way down here at the end, when we shove our app into the main window, we will do the same thing. We'll say fill equals TK. And in this case, I'll do TK.both. So it expands horizontally and vertically. And again, I want it to expand 100% of the width. So I'll say expand equals one. And now, yeah, there we go. Now as I expand and shrink, we should see that the 
yeah, so the, the gray area here is expanding down here to fill the full vertical height, but because I told my employee frame with this green background only to expand in the X direction, as I resize the window vertically, the green is not expanding, but the gray is, if that makes sense. So the green background area of this employee frame is only as tall as it needs to be, but it'll expand horizontally in the X direction as much as it needs to. Right, so this is starting to shape up to be a, well, I mean, a, a pretty awful timesheet app, but we're making some progress here. Um, so this leads us to another question, right? That one of the nice things, well, one of the few nice things about this app at the moment is when I click these buttons up here, they do things. Um, in fact, mm, well, in fact, Jeff, think about this thing later. Uh, we'll knock it ahead of ourselves. Um, what it would be nice is if I could click these buttons and have it do something like print Nate is checked in, Palmer is checked in, Chris is checked in, and so on. Um, how might we do that? Well, we run into just a little bit of a conundrum, which is um, in our button definitions up here, we were allowed to give the name of a function that we wanted to call when we click the button, um, but we we aren't don't have anywhere that we can put the parameters. So let's say let's let's write the function we want to call first. So I'll say uh, def login, which will take uh, the name of an employee, and it will just say print out um, string name plus is logged in for is logged in. That's fine. Very excited about it, right? So this is the function we'd like to call. So when we when we click on you know, when, when Palmer comes into the office for the day and clicks on Palmer, uh, it, it should print out Palmer is logged in. It would be really nice if we didn't have to write a, you know, a Palmer log in function and a Nate log in function, right? But currently that looks like what we have to do. We're only allowed to pass a function name to this parameter. We don't have anywhere to put like our own additional variables to feed into our login function but there's a way around that, and I will show you what it is. We're going to use a uh, just a little piece of a library that we have not used before called functools. I'm gonna say from functools import partial. The functools library has all kinds of useful functionality for um, monging functions into places that you need them and getting them to the right forms. Um, the partial function works like follows. Um, let's see. What's a good way to demo this? Let's just do this in our employee buttons here. So in this case, um, I'm going to set a command for each of my employee buttons here. And that command is going to be, rather than just saying log in, right? If I just say the command is log in, well, I don't have a way to pass a name to it. And I really have to pass it a name um, uh, so that it will print out the correct login statement. What I'm gonna do is wrap this function in a partial statement. Um, from our func tools library. And all the partial statement does is basically turn a function you have written with arguments into a function name that you can pass to a command. So in this case, um, when I click on the button with the name employee, I want to call the function login with the parameter of the name of the employee. All right, so now if I run this code and we'll, oops, Ah, okay, and it's not just the login function, it is the login function of this class. So self.login with the parameter, the name of that employee. So if everything's gone right, if I click on Palmer, I get Palmer is logged in. If I click on Mary, Mary is logged in. Nate is logged in, Kenneth is logged in, and so on, right? Of course, it's not preventing us from logging in multiple times and maybe racking up um, multiple timesheets, which is not great. Um, but the partial function is a way of wrapping functions that need arguments uh, to give them uh, to places where you need the name of a function and you aren't allowed to give arguments. And for what it's worth, um, this, this partial construct takes multiple arguments if you need to. Um, so let's say, um, uh, just for, um, uh, for argument's sake, the login function um, day is Sunday. Let's say we had some code that was updating the day of the week here, um, and we wanted to print out not just the name, um, but also the day of the week. And we'll call that a today parameter that we have to pass to our login function here. Um, on plus string today, right? So now I have two func two parameters that I need to pass to this function to get it to run right. So I can say partial equals self.login will run this function with the parameters employee 
and our day. So now when I run our code, I can say Palmer is logged in on Sunday. Mary is logged in on Sunday. And this could be the day, this could be the time, maybe, you know, maybe does some, some employee number look up here as well. Um, but the partial statement is really useful in working in these contexts. Uh, if, if it doesn't make total intuitive sense, it's basically a way of saying, hey, I need to call this first parameter is our function, and these later ones are all of the parameters we would be passing to that function in this case. Yeah? Did that, does that sort of track how we're using the partial statement here to, to give the name of a function over, or at least feel like you could play around with it and figure it out? This is good. As you think about questions, I can check my cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, let's see. We talked about more buttons. We talked about font. We talked a little about changing properties. Mm, let's talk about uh, variables. Ah, Chris has a question. Is it possible to have the text show up in a frame instead of the shell? Any only have one line that clears and writes the next thing above it? Probably advanced thing. Uh... Uh, Chris, I'm not 100% sure I'm understanding your question, but I think the object you're thinking of um, is uh, is something that we are going to cover. Um, but let's jump to it now. Um, the name for that in um, uh, in tkinter code language is a uh, a message. Um, so let me let me make one, and we'll see if it's the thing that we're both we're both thinking of here. Um, let's. Uh, Tell you what, let's get rid of these employee buttons here. I'm just going to comment everything out uh, below our second button just to make ourselves a little bit more um, room on our... Oops, I could show you the code and then you could <laughs> you could play along, which might be nice for y'all. Uh, let's see. All right, that's a little bit cleaner, so now we have some room here. Um, so below that button, we will create uh, a message object, tk.message to be a parent of the overall object. Um, we'll start it with a text. Uh, this is a message object. Um, and let's give it a starting width. So this is a parameter you can pass to any tkinter object. Um, oh, I need to pack that in, of course. My mess.pack. Um, so this is... Uh, I mean, actually, it may not be 100% what you're thinking of, Chris. There's another thing we can look at in a second here. The difference between a message object and a label is that a message object will do text wrapping for you. Um, so let's put some additional text in here. This is a message object with lots of text and things to say. And Chris asked if this was possible, if Jeff understood him right. Bunch of text, right? So now that obviously is doing a text wrapping for me, and it's not going to be wider than the width that we set. This is really useful if you have um, text that's going to be based on like user input or like input from the web. Um, if you're saying, hey, get back, uh, you know, this string of text from a website using the request library, putting it inside of a message object rather than a label object is not a bad idea um, just because the text drafting is handled nicer. But as I'm thinking about it, Chris, what you, what, is it possible to have the text show up in a frame any only have one line that clears and write the next thing above it. So the closest thing I can think of, Chris, to, I, to maybe actually what you're asking about um, is, uh, let's see, a text box object, which I don't think I have in my example slides, but I do use in, uh, here, I do use in some programs I'm writing currently. Um, there's a list box, that's not what I really want. Uh, let's see here. I'm so I, I'm right now we're can I blow this up so we can actually see? Yeah, I sure can. Um, we're in the code for a, a piece of, a, of something I'm writing for work at the moment. Um, as as usual, I've tied in the things that we're learning this week to things I'm doing either for my hobbies or for my work because frankly, it like it helps me out to learn more things about the things I'm doing for work. It gives me more confidence in what I'm teaching. It's a good synergy, I like to think. So let's see here. Am I thinking of a list box? Maybe I'm not. Um, ah, Chris says, uh, clarifies, um, not quite what I was thinking. Like when you click on the click me, then the message shows up where you put that message box you just created. Ah, so you're asking like, how do I make like uh, events or button clicks change the, the say the messaging um, inside of uh, maybe a message or a label object? 
um, and it clears out the previous statement or maybe bumps it up a notch. The clearing out and replacing is easy. The like doing it sort of a stacking queue is a slightly different thing is also doable. Um, so what Chris, the, there's a couple different ways we can do what you're talking about. One would be to modify the functions that happen when the buttons are clicked. Um, so let's say, so here, let's, let's look at what our code is doing now. Um, so let's say instead of printing to the screen, you know, you clicked me and you shouldn't have clicked me. Um, let's have it change the, let's have it put that text inside our message object here. Here's how we'll do that. So our click me button is running this self dot button clicked command. So we'll go down and I'm just going to blow away these, this employee code for now. Um, so in the button click command, rather than printing it out, although maybe let's, let's still print it out just so we know when something should be happening. What I will do is get my message object here. I will say my mess, and then I'm going to treat that object like it's a dictionary with a parameter of text. And I will say that that text should now be, you clicked the button. All right. So now when I run this code, when I click the button, oops. My mess is not defined. Oh, ah, uh-huh. So I think what has happened here, yes. So I'm not currently preserving a reference to this object outside of this function, right? What I really need to do is say that the my message object of my app, self.myMessage is equal to this thing. And we'll see when I run the program, it doesn't look any different, but now my, my object that is my app is gonna preserve a reference to this my mess object. Oh. Oh, and then I'm going to, of course, need to reference that version of the my mess object down in my function here. So now, there we go. All right, let's, let me show you that again, now that, now that I know it works. Um, so what's happening here is uh, we're holding on to a reference to this my mess, my message object here. And when I click it, we're calling the function button clicked, which is printing out you click the button to the terminal and setting the text attribute of the my message object to you clicked the button. And I can do the same with the, you should not have clicked the button here. I can say self dot my message text equals, and we'll have it be the same as, uh, as what it's printing to the screen, right? So if I say, don't click me, you should not have clicked the button. And we'll see it's doing this nice text wrapping there. That's a nice demo. If I click me, we're back to, you click the button. You should not have clicked the button. You click the button, not click the button, and so on. We could have these functions do other things as well. We could have these functions maybe change the background color of some of these parameters, of some of these other objects. So we could say uh, self.myMess.config bg equals uh, green when they clicked the button. And with a little magic of copy paste, we'll say background equals red when they should not have clicked the button. Don't click me, click me, don't click me, click me. And these buttons, of course, could be doing lots of other things, right? They could be reaching out to the internet for information. They could be soliciting more user input or running scripts in the background or various things. Um, but that's a simple way of changing the, especially, excuse me, the text parameters of things like messages and labels. Also works for labels. You can say, you know, my label.text equals, equals whatever. Or my, my label with the attribute text equals whatever. Um, Things get a little bit trickier when we start to talk about um, text entry. So ways to like enter text into a screen. Um, so let's look at a couple ways. Let's say uh, rather than having our um, employees here, let's, let's clean up our app a little bit here. We'll delete a few labels. Um, we'll say, please, please log in. Uh, and we'll say login will be how a big button says login. Oh, and maybe we'll put a big quit button here. This might be a fun example. Um, so this is what our app is going to look like now. In a moment, we will we'll insert some text entry here. So rather than coming up and clicking on your name, uh, maybe the employee comes up to a terminal and types their name in and clicks login, right? Um, and we'd like to be able to quit out of this app for some reason, <laughs> let's say. Um, so rather than calling a function that we've written ourselves, this self.don't method, let's use a function that's already written for us that we've used before. We'll say from sys import exit. And we've used the exit function before. Remember, sys.exit just kills the, the program immediately. So we'll say, rather than saying self.don't, we'll just say we'll use the exit command, right? Now I can get rid of this. Get out of here. And we'll, we'll probably need to rewrite some login function, but for the time being, right? So now I have my login function. Of course, this button uh, doesn't doesn't know to reference this my message object anymore because it's gone. But if I click quit, the app quits. P 
piece of cake. Um, here, we'll take away the, the message object uh, changing code in our, our button click there. So now let's turn this into a, a program that has a little text entry box here um, that we can type our name in. Uh, and well, for that, we will use uh, a new tkinter object called an entry. So we'll say, uh, let's see, self.name entry. Because I'm going to hold the name of our employee. And I should say, so the reason that we're, I'm using self.name entry here is the same reason that I had to use self.my message earlier, is that all of these variables that are holding references to these various things, they're really only going to be accessible within the function that we're using them because we're not sort of holding on to, we're not saying, hey, my object that I'm creating, my window that I'm creating, this object is going to be a part of you. I think my self.config, self.your name entry, the name Name entry of this app is going to be this thing. Otherwise, we just kind of have these variables floating around that we're using to create objects on the screen. And if we're not going to reference them again, that's fine. But I suspect I'm going to need to reference this object in some other functions. And so I'm going to make sure that it is an object that specifically belongs to this class that I am working with, if that sort of makes sense. Um, so to create an entry box, I'm going to say self tk.entry. Uh, the parent is, of course, always going to be the, the big frame itself. Not always, but in our case. Um, and I'm going to check my check my cheat sheet here. Uh, let's see for entries. Ah, uh huh. Entry. Yes, good. This is what I this is what I thought it was. Um, so we're going to introduce a if I show you the code, a new parameter here called a text variable. Um, and I'll show you that in a second here make it none for now. And we'll say font equals my small font. And we'll say, we'll pack that in. We'll say self.nameentry.pack, right? And oop, my small, oh, my small font is what I should have said here. We'll run that and we get our text entry box here where I can type in a name. Of course, it doesn't do anything yet, um, but I can, I can just sort of type in a name there. And of course, my button function down here just says I click the button. But I can say Palmer and log in and so on. Really, what I'd like to do is sort of save this in a list somewhere and then probably clear this entry. So how are we going to get the value of the text that our user has typed into our entry box here? We'll do that using a special kind of variable that tkinter uses, which has some nice additional properties. Um, so in this case, I will say self dot name var so name of my variable equals tk dot string var um, there are a few types of special variables in tkinter you have string var uh, which is a, a text string int var is a whole number double var um, and i think boolean var for true false um, which function a lot like the python types we know already strings integers uh, floating point numbers, so fractions and decimals, and true false values. Um, and in this case, um, I can, if I want to, I can preset the value of this variable to say uh, whatever I want. And in this case, because it's not a, you know, a standard string object, it's this special tkinter string variable type that it, we'll see why we're using it in a second here. I can't just say name var equals such and such. I have to say name var dot set and give it some text and say, please type your name, right? And now I want to make the text variable of this entry, this text entry field, equal to self.nameVar, the variable that I want it to be. And we'll see that it's already, that variable has taken the value uh, of, or the, the rather the text in the entry is equal to whatever is in this variable. So whatever I type in this field will become the value of this variable, and whatever I put in the value of this variable will be in the field. Um, so one way to show that is say rather than our button um, printing out just this generic statement, let's say that it uh, rather prints out uh, self.namevar.get, which is the opposite of .set. This just gets the text in this name variable. So now if I type in my name, if I, oops, if I say Jeff and hit login, it prints out Jeff because that's in the field. If I type Jeff and log in, right? If I, whatever is typed into this field is what's stored in this name var. Whatever's stored in this name var shows up in this field, right? So a really easy way of getting and setting the text that appears on the screen there. Um, so really what I'd like to say is when that button is clicked, um, I will say self.namedar.get plus is logged in. 
right? So if I type here and I say Chris, and I hit log in, I get Chris is logged in. Really what I might like to do is like when you hit the login button, maybe this should clear, right? So the next employee can just walk up and type their name. Um, and that's really easy to implement, right? I want to basically, you know, in, in normally, right, this would log to a file or interact with your payroll system or more complicated things. But this, of course, this class is not payroll systems class. This is GUI class. So I will say, well, we'll log Chris in uh, or, or whoever's typed their name. And then I will say self.namevar.set. And I'll just set it to an empty string. I'll just set that text to zero whenever we click. So I'll say, uh, Katie is logging in. And when I click the login button, Katie is logged in and we set the value of that variable to be, you know, an empty string to be nothing. And that cleared our login field here. Um, so that's a, a simple way of um, typing in, uh, you get, getting text entry of, of singular fields. Um, now to get just a little bit more complicated, it's slightly out of order, but what else is new? Um, we uh, also can um, do something like, what if I want, um, this is going to be a little bit uh, contrived uh, for, ah, uh, here, okay. Let's change up the, the theory of our app a little bit here. And I'll do it just by changing some labels. Rather than doing an employee login app, let's make an ATM, because that's a good idea. Um, we'll change the label at the top to say ATM, so that's how we'll know it's an ATM. And we'll change our login button to say, uh, to be the give money button. Um, and please type your name will instead be, well, we'll st let's start this out as empty. Um, and we'll make ourselves an extra little label here to, to make it clear what the, what the, um, uh, what the app is doing. We'll say money label equals TK dot label self text equals, um, how many dollars would you like <laughs> font equals my small font. Uh, and money label dot pack, right? So how many dollars would I like? And I want to say I type a number in here and then I click money and it'll print out down here how much money it's given, AKA withdrawal. No, 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 let me be clear, Chris. This is not like a banking system. This is one of those automated teller machines, much like any teller will just hand you cash. This is one of those, just like maybe a money cannon is really what we're, what we're developing here more than sort of a classic ATM. <laughs> um, so one thing that might be nice is if we are, we presumably we want uh, this to be, um, we want our user to be able to type whatever they want here, because maybe they make a typo, um, but really we want this to be an integer. Like we want this to be a whole number, number of dollars. Um, it would be nice if when the user types anything that wasn't an integer, uh, this give money button say grayed out or turned red, just to be like, just to emphasize the fact like, hey, the thing you've typed in, I, I cannot do for you. Um, <laughs> give money robot, please give money to, please give money. Um, so what we really would like to do is not just look at the, the text in this entry field when we click the button, we'd like to sort of check it more frequently. And whenever it's changed to something that is not an integer, we'll do something to indicate to the user that they've typed bad. Um, the, so one thing we could do is like sort of look at that input every quarter of a second and change things then, but there's a cleaner way to do it within tkinter using uh, what's called variable traces. Um, so what I'm going to do here, uh, as soon as I've defined my name variable, and again, this is going to be a string, um, because I want the user to be able to type whatever they want. I just want to tell them that they did it bad after the fact. Um, I'm going to say, uh, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. Self dot name var dot trace underscore add right uh, self dot check input. Okay, so what's going on here? So I'm going to take my name variable and I'm going to add a trace function to it. Uh, basically, this is saying every time I write to the value of this string variable, which is to say anything that I, anytime that I type something in on screen um, or anytime that anything else changes that variable, right? So down here, when I set it to, to an empty string, it would also trigger this. Whenever a write, whenever this variable changes, run this function. Whether we're gonna give, again, the name of the function, no, no parentheses, just the name of a function we want to call. And what I'll do is inside that function, I will check whether my uh, variable is of the type that I want it to be and take some action appropriately. So let's write this check input function. 
will say def uh, check input. Again, takes no parameters, and I will say uh, value equals self dot name. It's still going to be it's still currently called name var, although of course now it's representing a an amount of money. Um, and let me think here. Um, what the appropriate syntax for checking whether something is an integer is. Um, but thankfully, I have done this before, and I'm going to go back and cheat in my older code. Um, I will show you the project that I uh, am keep referencing my code from that I'm, I'm working on for work, because it's nothing, nothing terribly proprietary. Um, but uh, And it's a good example of what using uh, tkinter is for. Let's see... Delay entry validate. Yeah, so I have a very similar challenge in my code at work, um, which uh, basically is, is I'm, I wrote some code to check whether the user has inputted an integer uh, as a number of milliseconds to delay in a specific circumstance. Um, so this is kind of the code that I'm going to reuse for our purposes. It's like, it's like having my own personal stack overflow, <laughs> but on the other computer, which is kind of handy. Um, so what I will say is, uh, first, if val equals uh, empty string return false. So really I'm gonna, going to, uh, let's see, do I want to validate things here or just do things? Hmm, hmm, <laughs> um, Yeah, here's what we're gonna do. Um, I'm going to make a new function called set input uh, state self and yeah. So really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of split this out into two functions um, just because I, I really wanna separate the idea of checking whether the input is valid or not from the actions of like disabling or enabling parts of the screen because this functionality, like the checking whether inputs are true or like is a valid integer or not feels reusable. And as we've seen, um, I'm, I'm reusing it basically from my older code. Whereas this function, which is going to change specific parameters of our program feels a little bit more niche. So my instinct is to break those into two sort of separate functions here. So really what I should do here is when we, when we change our string far, I'm going to call self.set input state. Um, the first thing it's going to do is say, if check input equals true, then, um, enable the login, the, uh, money button. Otherwise, disable the money button. And those are just comments for now. We'll come back and flesh those out in a second. But let's finish up our, our validation function here. So if the string that we're getting is just an empty string, right? Obviously, empty is not a valid amount of dollars to return. So we can start there. Otherwise, um, what I'm going to do is say uh, this, this uh, code that we've not really seen yet, and I won't go super deep into, but I'll say, uh, let's see, x equals int value. And I will say accept value error as e return false, otherwise return true. So what's happening here is I'm taking my my value, which is in theory a you know what it's whatever the user has typed in, um, and saying hey what is the integer? What if I cast that to an integer? What is the integer equivalent of this string? And if this string is an integer, if it's you know if it's you know one two three whatever, um, then x will be an integer with that value. How perfect! If it's a you know a more string like thing like my name, it's going to throw an error, much like when we try and like do something that's you know messed up and it it makes these errors pop up at the bottom of our screen. What's happening there is the program is saying, hey, hey, hey I, I don't know what to do here. Um, yeah, there's an error there. So really what I'm doing, I'm, I'm abusing that functionality to say, okay, if this causes an error to happen, then it's not a valid input. Otherwise, it is a valid input. And we'll talk more about this try and accept structure in a future a future stream, I imagine. Um, but, but all to there is to know for now is I'm, I'm trying to do this thing. I'm trying to say, hey, can I represent this string as an integer? If that causes an error, well, then our input wasn't valid. But otherwise, that, that, val that input must be valid. Does that sort of make sense? I hope so. Um, so this is going to be our function that tells us whether what the user has typed in, you remember, in our, our worst ATM. Uh, let's see. Uh, expected an indented block. Uh, let's see. What have I goofed on here? Else. Something is something is not right. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is that? Line 47? Oh, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. Oh, you know what I need? I need a little bit of valid code here so it parses correctly. So I'll just put a pass statement in there. There we go. Remember, what we're doing here set input position 
Ah, okay. This is another good thing to know about T. Kenter, right? So as soon as I started typing, let me clear this out. As soon as I started typing, I got oops, an error. It says set input state takes one positional argument, but four were given. So when you use a uh, a variable trace like this, um, it's passing along a, a lot of things, including uh, why the, like, you know, I'm saying to, hey, call this function anytime I change this variable, anytime I write to this variable. It will actually pass me a fair amount of input about what did the changing, which is kind of cool. Um, it'll say what function and what class and various things, but most of the time that's a little bit not what I want. Um, so rather than just having this set input state function take no parameters, I'm going to use this construction called uh, asterisk args. Um, which again is another thing I guess we won't get super deep into tonight, but it basically says capture any any remaining arguments that are given, whether it's one or a thousand, and refer to them as the list args. Um, and this is just going to give those extra information that the library gives us, where the function came from, why it was called, someplace to go. We're never going to use it again in our function. We just need to make sure that we have a name to give it so our program doesn't throw up on us. Um, and check input is not defined, ah, because this could should be the check input method of this class, so self.checkInput. So now, now when I run this function, it should be checking under the hood whether, uh, whether or not this is uh, a valid input, which of course this is not. But our thing that would actually change the view of the screen doesn't do anything yet. So let's make it do something. Um, let's double check our, our tkinter reference here um, for how we change the state of an object. Yes, so we'll set the state parameter of an object to normal, active, or disabled. So what I will do is say self dot, what did I call that button? My butt? <laughs> I knew that was going to come back and, and give me joy. Self dot my butt uh, state equals, I believe it's going to be tk dot active. Otherwise, self dot my butt state equals tk dot disabled. So now if I type in a number, nothing should change, but if I type in, oops, app object has no attribute my butt. <laughs> ah, okay. so here's another, I'm glad I'm countering all these errors, learn from my mistakes, right? So again, this is just a floating freeform variable called my butt within this function. I really want it to be captured by this object. I really want to say, hey, this is, these, these, this object, this, this app object has a button called my butt that we can reference later. Yeah, there we go. So now when I type a string like Jeff, my money is grayed out. Sort of the default disabled value is a, a, a desaturated version, a grayed out version of the, the whatever it, it normally is. Um, but when I type in a number, it lights up green. And of course we've maintained our functionality from before. Ooh, I've got an error here. False is not defined. Ah, well, <laughs> because false should have a capital in our, in our Pythoniness. So now I'm not even allowed to click the give money button, but if I type any valid integer, well, now it still says this is uh, this is logged in, uh, but you can see it was able to accept that as a valid integer and I was able to click my money and give myself a lot of money. So now we'll just clean up the button clicked function uh, so that we can say here is a dollar sign and the value of that function. And then again, we will clear that out after it's done. So give me a lot of money, give money, and here's a bunch of dollars down here. I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader if you wanted to figure out how to uh, automatically put commas in between every third set of decimals in that string variable, whether your user has typed them in or not. Right? Parsing user input is actually a, a very much a non-trivial problem, um, but that might be a fun thing to try and sort of work out on your own. Questions? I felt like I had to take a big old swig because I think we're, um, I think, uh, is there a way to deactivate the button when no text exists? Yeah, Chris, we're actually kind of already doing that. Um, I, th I think we are doing that. Um, so, ah, I see, so right here at the beginning 
uh, we're, we're still active here. But as soon as we change it and come back to nothing, we can see it, it deactivates. Uh, and that's because our check input function here, right, that's gets getting run every time that text changes, says that if the text is totally empty, return false. So really, what I might want to do is um, up here, once I've configured all of my, configured my entry here, I might just want to call um, self.set input state um, just once when the program starts. Uh, ah, okay. But I need to do it after I've created my butt because it's going to reference that state later on. So maybe I'll do this down here um, right before I initialize the program. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, so now it's going to initialize everything, including the empty string here, and then it's going to gray out there um, because the, the variable starts as empty. And then I can type in an invalid value, it's still gray, type in an integer, and it's valid, clear it out, and it's invalid again. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think I think I only have two more examples for us tonight. They are going to be some, I promise, a little bit of physical interactivity. And this is, I guess, one of the two sort of main ways that I think of using tkinter um, is as an interface to a physical installation. Um, the other is sort of as a software base. Um, so I'm going to show both of those off to you now. So actually I, have, actually, I have three things to show you. One, some physical interaction. Two, I want to go through the program that list that has like most of the usual interactive objects to, to like demo a few more of the things you could get into. I don't think we'll get super deep into like how to use each and every individual widget um, because they're all fairly similar. And they all rely on you, you know, initialize them, you can configure them with initial objects, and you can pack them into your program. We should look at, there's one more way, and we'll get into this in that example, of how you arrange objects in the screen that's not just sort of layering them vertically. And then I want to share with you just, I, frankly, it's a little bit of a show off, the uh, the program I'm writing in Tkinter for work, because I think it will be a good example of how a, a program that is sort of more structured might look that's written in Tkinter. So let's look at our physical interactivity. And we're back to the overhead table cam. I feel like we so rarely use it these days, which is a real shame. Um, but this will be a fun time. So what I have here is a, you know, a mock-up of a, a physical installation that you might have that you are building. Maybe, maybe the world's saddest Christmas light display. Um, I probably, you know, three or four orders of magnitude smaller than what Chris is building. Um, but this, you know, this could be our, our pumpkin man from the other week. This could be any physical installation. And, and what I want is maybe as an end product, or maybe just for testing purposes, just to write a little GUI app so I can click on and test each of these parameters. This is something I find myself doing quite a bit as I'm working on things is like, you know, I'm writing some code in the side and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm having some trouble getting the servo to do what I want. I really just want to like be able to like click a button that maybe like moves my servo back and forth to tell me it's working, All right? This goes long way back to like, you know, having little simple test programs available to test individual snippets, especially of your hardware as you're building something. Wouldn't it be nice if you, instead of having to like write a little command line program, you could write yourself a little program that allows you to say, you know, I'm not sure if my code is broken or my hardware is broken, uh, test LEDs. Oh, the LEDs are not working. Okay, so it's a hardware problem and now I can go troubleshoot that. So here's an example of something that you might do. This is the traffic light example on the website if you're playing along at home. Um, so we're going to import tkinter and tk font and other things. We're also going to import the LED object from the GPIO0 library as we've, we've seen so often before. Um, here, I'll bring the table back up because it's relevant to us. Um, and this app is going to look very much like the ones we've already written, right? The app is a, a subclass of the frame. We'll initialize it and then we'll give it some LEDs to work with, right? So I have my, my red LED object equals LED 26 because it's on, on pin 26 here. I swear I've checked. And just a reminder as always that that is GPIO pin 26 and not physical pin 26. Um, just uh, using the the reference that we've seen so many times before that the GPIO pins all have their own individual names. Yes, I, I know you use cookies. Um, so remember to look up the appropriate name of your pin as you're plugging these things in. Uh, so we have three LEDs there. Uh, and then I'm going to create some, some labels and some buttons associated to each of those LEDs and one that turns it off. So let me show you the app and then we'll just really briefly go through how it works. Oh, I've got an error here. Can I use manager pack inside app, which is, ah, okay. Ah, yes. Ah, okay, good. This is an example of something I want to show off. Uh, column equals 
zero. So we have not seen this grid command yet, but I'll show it to you in just a second here. So now I have my, my, little, my little app here with three buttons, red, yellow, green, and off. And you might guess that as I click the red, yellow, and green buttons, bring that out here, my various LEDs turn on. As I click off, they all turn off. And I also have it changing the background color of my main frame here. This might be the kind of thing that I would whip together just to be, you know, especially if I had multiple LEDs or multiple servos or something weird going on. I wanted to just be able to say, hey, call up my hardware test program and just like test how things are working. Uh, and none of the functionality of this should come as a surprise. Each of these buttons, uh, calls a command using that partial construct that we used earlier to be able to give our button press function uh, a parameter red or yellow or green, depending on what button we're pressing. And that button press function is really just an if an if else statement, right? It says, um, first turn everything off. And then if I've given it the color red, set the background color of the screen to red and turn the red LED on. If it's yellow, background color is yellow, turn the yellow LED on. If the, if the, uh, the color parameter of this function is green, turn the background color green and turn the green LED on. Chris says, thinking this could be cue lights and need multiple devices listening to each other. Yeah, for sure. The, the challenge there, I think it is, is probably more to do with um, uh, the networking and like, interconnectivity than like the on-screen part of things. Um, but yeah, it certainly could be. Um, the I know at least one theater that uses a Raspberry Pi driven cue light system, um, which is sort of notoriously temperamental. Um, that's the kind of thing that I feel like an Arduino might, if you, especially if we're not talking about a digital interface, right? If it's got a, a HDMI screen, Raspberry Pi, if it's just like buttons and switches and lights, maybe Arduino at most, maybe a hardwired relay thing. Like that's one of those things because it needs to be so super reliable in a show context that really wants to be sort of as straightforward and failure proof as possible, in my mind, at least. Um, but that's just me. Um, that might also be because, as I think about it, um, at, at this theater that I, that I will not name that's running Raspberry Pi driven cue lights, um, when I was there, we built a, basically a hardwired, like, switch-based system that worked, worked fine, totally not fancy, but worked great. This Raspberry Pi system that they replaced it with crashes a lot. At a, the theater I worked at after that, uh, I built an Arduino-driven cue light system that interfaced with the network, and that was also, uh... 80% robust. It was not as robust as the like hard switches system, um, but worked pretty well and also was cheap. And I built it at like four in the morning one night after the old system died. So I feel okay about that. Um, <laughs> yes, Palmer, I do. Uh, not anymore. Uh, right as I was departing that theater, uh, I, me and my colleague transitioned that to, um, to a, a better system, but that's a story for another time. Um, so yeah, so this is like, just, just as you think about putting together hardware based programs with Raspberry Pi, this can be a really nice little tool, um, either for a final user interface or just for like whipping together a little utility screen to be able to test what's going on in your hardware or in your software with a program, right? So just a little thing to spur some inspiration. Um, the thing that's worth looking at in this is rather than using the pack statement to get these, these buttons and these labels onto the screen, I've used the grid command. You do have to use either or within each context. So everything that's un underneath my main frame here, it has to be either grid or pack. I actually got that error earlier. If I try and grid some things in and pack some things in. It says, hey, I don't know what geometry manager you're trying to use. That's sort of like, what sort of paradigm am I just shoving everything in? Are we gonna lay things out in a grid? You're trying to use both and I don't know what you want me to do. So you at least have to be consistent. Um, but the grid manager is very flexible. You might guess just from the way it's being used here that you can set the row and column position of each of the elements that you add in rather than just stacking things vertically. So let's say rather than having uh, my my things vertically here, I wanna have my label on top and I'll make a little square out of it. So we'll do row zero, column zero, row one, column zero, row one, uh, row zero, column one, row one column one. Ugh, it's not <laughs> ugh, it's not very pretty, but uh, let's see. Did I type something here? Oh yeah, I, I left this one out. We'll say uh, row uh, two column zero. So this is the ch this is I think the primary challenge of using the um, grid manager is it's not super forgiving. Uh, of like making changes, you do kind of have to plan out your layout because then you have to go back and set the row and column of each of these parameters of each of these objects individually. But it does allow you a fair amount of flexibility in terms of like where your objects go 
on screen here, if that makes sense. And again, functionality is the same. It's just a matter of, of layout. Um, so that's, that's the gist of the grid manager. Um, uh, although there's more, I'm sure, to get into there, but but worth playing around with as you're as you're laying out your your uh, your programs. Yeah. Questions? I need a little. I'm I'm running a little bit dry. I need a little sip. I want then I want to show you sort of a built out Tkinter program. Oh no no no! I want to show you this big pile of widgets. In fact, why don't I get this up on screen and you can admire the beautiful graphic designs going on here while I take a brief question break. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it so lovely? Oh, <laughs> no, you haven't seen it yet. Uh, now isn't it beautiful? Now isn't it lovely? It helps if I show you the thing that I want you to look at, I suppose. Um, that's that's how stream do goo. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, as Chris says, I'm going to take another pause. You can enjoy. This is really just a sign. This is the universe telling me that I need to hydrate a little bit better. Whoops. Um, so here's just a little smattering of various interface options, not particularly laid out in any particular order. Um, if you want to go to uh, Jeff.class has electronic smash and look at the lots of widgets sketch, that just has, basically has one of most of the interface widgets that are available to you. I don't have all of them hooked up to do specific things. Um, this is more just about like what the visuals are that they're representing, but just to give you a sort of broad overview of like things you can do to get the imagination flowing. So buttons we've seen, check boxes, right? Checking an option on or off. Um, our text entry, which I think I hooked up to, yeah, text entry, right, that we've typed in before. This is a label and a message, right, which we saw both of before, the, the label which sort of grows without bound and the message which does text wrapping for you. It's very handy. Um, this is a list box. Um, this is what you might use if you uh, have need the, the user to select sort of a uh, an option from a short list. Um, uh, this one actually might be worth talking about a little bit more here. Um, and we'll, maybe let's, let's go look at exactly how that one works in a second here. Um, here's our message down before that we've hooked up so it is, it is changing value as I uh, change the entries here. We have our radio boxes, right? We, we can only select one of each of, of these three options, you know, red, green, or blue, not, not all of them together. We have a slider, right? We can change the, the value represented on a, a sliding scale. This is called a spin box, where you can have a value that you can either enter uh, or you can sort of change with these little buttons. I use these a lot for um, like select, I think I have this set up to a maximum of 60 because I like this for setting hour or minute within the hour. Um, and then you have an option box, which is like a, a drop down list of, you know, select an option from this, this list. Um, Let's take a quick look at this list box here, just to just to familiarize you with a little bit more syntax. Can you change the size of the checkbox or radio buttons, Chris? That is, a, excuse me, super good question. I'm I was looking for that answer just earlier today. I don't know that you can, but that seems wrong to me. I, I think it's just something that I don't know how to do, to be perfectly honest. Um, if someone wants to Google <laughs> uh, how to change checkbox size in Tkinter. I'd be super grateful, but I, I don't know it off the top of my head and, and couldn't find it in the 10 minutes before the stream when it occurred to me. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty hideous to have these giant text and little radio buttons. So let's let's find that answer out if we can. Um, just to give you an example of how that list box works, let's scroll down here. Scale, spin box, radio buttons, frames, uh, list box. Yeah, okay. So here's our, and I'll, maybe I'll see if I can bring it up on screen so we can see the Nah, that's gonna be a disaster. We'll just talk through it. Um, what we do first is create our list box object, which is you know tk.listbox, and the the overarching object that it is underneath is you know the, the full window as before. And then we use this listbox.insert method to put new objects into the list box. And then we give it the index, the sort of place in the list where we want the new object to be, either a number like we do down here, or we can use this special value tk.end to just put it at the end of the list, right? So, uh, and there's a variety of ways we can do this. We can give it a, a singular object like this string first, and we'll see that that just shows up in our list here. We can give it multiple strings. So I can say first comma second, right? And it will gladly put 
uh, or I guess second comma third, it probably puts second and third in there. You can also give it a list of objects. Um, and this is a structure that we, again, we'll, we'll talk about in more detail um, list comprehensions in a later class. Um, but if we want to say, you know, have a list of objects, like maybe we're using this to represent our employee list from earlier, we can't just say uh, insert my list. We have to prepend it by this asterisk, which basically says take this list and blow it out to be multiple um, multiple entries. So this asterisk my list structure here is basically the same as saying tk.end fourth if you will, uh, if I didn't make typos. Um, so this is the structure that it expects these values to come in as, as sort of separate uh, arguments. So to sort of blow this list up into sec separate arguments, we use this asterisk here. Like I say, that's a topic for another day. Only if you're playing around with tkinter and you want to put a list in, just consider you, you may need to blow that list out using this asterisk. So, so what I've done here is add first, second, third. This list gets blown out into fourth and fifth. Those are all getting stacked up at the end of the uh, the list box here, then I put in the entry zero at the zeroth index. And so what we end up with is zero, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Ah, oh, Chris has some answers. Height equals the size of the button. Ah, very cool. Let's go down and find our radio buttons here. Uh, radio buttons, which I had put, you'll see, you'll see, I put these radio buttons inside their own radio button frame again, so we can, we can deal with them as we want. Um, and we'll give it an option here, height equals 15. Is that going to be too big? Uh, width equals 15. I guess I don't know, Chris, if that was for, um, oh, 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 it's huge. Something's gone wrong. Let's start a little bit smaller. Let's say height equals three. Mm. Was that for the check boxes, Chris, or for the, um, for the radio buttons? Ooh, yeah. So this looks like it's affecting the the width of the objects themselves. Um, let's uh, okay checkbox. Let's go up and try the checkbox then. Check button. Yes, in T Kinder terms, they call it a check button. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, check. Let's see. So height equals three. Uh, yeah. So it seems like it's affecting not the size of the button but the, uh, the size of the, um, the tkinter object itself. See what I mean here? Hmm, interesting. Um, what other things are there to explore on this screen? Oh, um, one thing that's kind of fun, you can also do uh, menu systems in tkinter. So we have our, our file menu up here with new and quit. I think I made the quick button actually quit. Yeah, I did, how clever of me. Um, that's using the, the menu structure inside the tkinter library, um, which is not terribly hard to use. You basically create one menu that represents the bar at the top of the screen, and then a separate menu item that represents each of the dropdowns. Little pro tip for me, when you're creating your little dropdowns, use this tear off equals zero parameter. If you don't, you end up with a menu that you can literally uh, tear off and like move around the screen as a separate object, which is never a functionality, not really a functionality I ever want. I don't know why you would, um, but I mean, maybe that's the thing you want to do with your code. So I almost always say in my menus, tear off, uh, tear off equals zero. And that prevents the user from being able to rip their menus off their window. Very strange. The new button in this case doesn't do anything. Um, but really this is all to say, these are some cool things that you can, you know, a, a variety of things you can do with the tkinter library. If you want as a reference to like, to see what these various things look like in the code, I encourage you to go to the website and just check out the code for yourself, um, and see, see how they're implemented. Um, uh, and that might give you some clues into how to get started with them. I don't know if it's worth going super deep into all of them tonight. Um, cause I know a lot of this is like, you know, is everyone going to go out and build an app with all a dozen of these interface units tonight? I, I'd be impressed, but I doubt it. But here, just like file these away in your brain as things you can do and know that they'll be on the eBash website when you want to use them. Um, Chris says, I don't think you can change the default checkbox, but you can replace it with your own image, which you can then change the size of. Interesting. What an interesting model that seems so kludgy to me. But, but thank you, Chris. That's super great. Chris has kind of become the reference librarian of our, uh, of our streams on these Sundays, which is kind of fun. Um, neat. So let's, let's close tonight with just a little bit of like, uh, advanced tkintering. Um, 
I will, if I, assuming it runs, and I think it still does, if I haven't made too many typos. Uh, let's see, can I shrink this if I, yeah. So I will show you, so this is, uh, this is actually not the most recent uh, draft of, um, of the code I am writing for work at the moment. Uh, it might be a little bit small here because it's, it's meant to be interfaced with on a screen. Um, can I, is there an easy way in this view? Yeah, here, I'm just going to monge with my uh, my screen setup here uh, and just zoom in on this window. The laptop screen, and maybe, I may regret this later, but it seems like a fine thing to do for now. You can see a little bit there. Um, so I am writing a program to control uh, a 727 <laughs> that we have in our workplace um, that has some various movement axes um, that does a little automation show every half an hour. Um, and uh, the old program was written uh, on a computer running DOS 6.2, so I'm bringing it into the 21st century with this program. So I've actually broken it down into two separate programs, um, one of which I'm calling Show Maker, and the other is Show Player. And basically what this program does is uh, loads up various actions you can take with a couple of different kinds of controllers, one being the PLC, uh, which actually controls the plane, uh, which takes serial commands, and the other being a relay controller that is simulating button presses on a, a lighting control panel that sort of does things along with the plane show. Um, so you can see these are all, I mean, these are all parameters. These are all things that you pretty much know about, right? I have our, our menus up here, labels. We have our various color-coded labels here and, and buttons that do various things. I have my entry down here. That This is what I was referencing before. If a user wants to enter a delay in milliseconds, right, it validates that it's a, a valid uh, integer before it lets you add a delay. Um, and similarly, if you want to add a label to a step of your program, it, it validates that as well. Um, this program is meant to say, you know, maybe the first step of my program is uh, nose gear down, main gear down, inboard flap down, a 3,000 millisecond delay, and a label that says um, uh, gear down, and so on. Um, and basically build up our, our show in the steps file here. Then we can export it um, as a a show in a, it's so one of the fun things about Tkinter is it has, and we, I, I know we haven't looked at this site, it has this built in export import functionality. It works really nicely with um, your operating system. Um, and so I'm having it be able to save a show out to a file. And then I can use my show player program. I, it's really kind of academic. Like I don't, I don't know that I needed to necessarily split them up. Um, but in here, I can import the show that I made in show maker. Let's do mini test show. I can, using my, my options box here that we looked at, which allows me to sort of see the, the steps in any individual show. Um, this is a structure in Tkinter I don't think we looked at tonight because it's a little bit, a little bit uh, buggy, um, called a notebook, which allows you to sort of have a multiple tabbed interface that you can scroll through. Um, I can set the schedule by, by sort of day of the week and show and show time. Um, and then in my operations tab, um, looks like the, yeah, this is the version of the show that was not importing things to this window correctly. Um, but I can have it run my show as well. So actually output these serial commands and the lighting control commands of, um, uh, of whatever show we were looking at before. Yeah, you can see it's, it's silently, it's throwing errors in the background as I change the show because, um, I had, this is the version that didn't have these things listed. So, so this is, I mean, yes, I am showing off. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of this, but also like, you know, thinking about like how you can use Tkinter, this is, I think, a pretty decent example of things you might do. And it makes it really easy to do things like this. So like, in addition to playing back shows, um, I put in, I was like, it'd be really nice if I could just like toggle the, like the landing gear up and down. So I whipped together a little manual control tab, which is just some labels and some buttons that sends commands out into the universe and like makes the plane do things. Uh, let's see. Nate asked, does the 727 use hydraulics? So no, it's a, it's a pneumatic system and some electrics. So the landing gear, the elevator, and the rudder, and the, uh, the um, ailerons are all pneumatic, so they're air-driven. And then the flaps and, of course, all the lighting are an electrical system. Um, the original system was hydraulic, and apparently at install, they swapped that over to a pneumatic system for longevity's sake, I'm told. That was in like 95, that's a little before my time. Um, so yeah, and all this, you know, all of this code is is very similar to what we've been doing. There's just a lot, a lot more of it. Um, so here, I'll we'll scroll down to uh, some places where we're actually building some things in Tkinter. Uh, da, 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 da. So yeah, so things like notebook, manual. So here's like the, the code for the, let's zoom this in some, Oop, get out of there. 
um, that manual control tab with individual buttons for each of the axes. I'm creating a frame to hold it all, uh, and a frame to hold the buttons, and then uh, a message that tells me, hey, click the, the send and cancel buttons to do a thing. Um, and then we will create a bunch of create a bunch of buttons in, in various rows and columns to represent our various controls um, and the various commands they need to send out in the world to activate or deactivate the plane. Chris asks, is there anything that would conflict with each other? Like the gear can't go down until the door is up. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so so part of the reason I'm confident in writing this control program um, in uh, in Python in, and myself is the actual control of the axes is directly controlled by a PLC inside the belly of the plane that has um, interlocks and limit switches built in. So yeah, so you can't put the, you can't start the main gear down motor if the main gear door is not open and all that. That's all handled on the PLC side and in hardware. Um, what this program does essentially at the end of the day is just send individual serial commands to that PLC to say, hey, please, please open gear door, please send flaps down. Um, and if it can't, it won't. Um, so this is an, this is more of an uh, an automation sequencer than an automation controller, which is which is great in my book. Like I, that's a whole other level of safety concern um, that I wouldn't necessarily be bashing together in Python in this case. Um, the lighting controller doesn't have any interlocks on it because it's not as much of a safety concern. Um, let's see. Nate says air leaks don't ruin guest clothes. Hydraulic fluid stains more to my work clothes. Yeah, it's not okay. This is a story. This is just between you and me and the internet. Um, part of there was, there was a time when, um, the, uh, a piece came off of the plane during some maintenance, let's just say, and, uh, it fell down to the floor, which was during a maintenance window, which is fine. No, no guests in the museum. Um, but the plane sits directly over a 2,400 square foot HO model train set. And this piece of the plane fell directly on, um, the downtown model of Chicago that's on that train set. Um, and caused a significant amount of damage. It looked like Godzilla had come through and sort of busted apart downtown Chicago falling off this plane. Um, it, the pictures are kind of horrifying and, and kind of amazing. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a perfectly foolproof system, but it, the error was not caused by the automation. The error was caused by the automation not being sufficiently locked out while people had uh, uh, materials and tools uh, where they needed to be for the maintenance window. So always remember to lock out, tag out your, uh, your equipment there, kids. Um, what week do I cover PLCs? I feel like there are liability issues with me claiming to, A, claiming to be a PLC expert in any sense, and B, trying to teach that over the internet. It's like trying to teach a rigging class over the internet. Like, it's one thing to be like, yeah, shackles are cool, and another to be like, to, to even falsely instill in anyone that, including myself, has the ability to like, learn PLCs over the internet is a little bit scary, so that's probably a, a pretty long, long way off. Things falling off aircraft. Uh, Chris, I've, or uh, Nate, I've never heard that term before, and I love it. TFOA. Do you say TFOA or TFOA? I think TFOA probably, right? Um, that's hilarious. Um, yeah, if I can ever get those pictures. Well, I don't know. I don't know if those pictures. Nate, I will send you those pictures if I ever have them. Let's say that. Um, <laughs> what Nate said me too. Yeah. Yeah, things falling off aircraft is not not ideal. There, there's you know how when you uh you, you like leaf through the rule book in a new place of work and you're like, why is there a very specific rule about X? Like, you know why why is there a rule that like chairs can't have seats higher than 20 inches? Or why is there a rule like that all wrenches have to be back in this cabinet before you can energize? And it's always because somebody screwed something up. And this, this is this is the Charles rule, <laughs> like because this is the Karen rule. Somebody screwed something up and it's in the book. Um, and uh, we, this, this, we have some rules now specifically put in place about how you have to um, interlock out the, the aircraft system before you can do maintenance on it, which, you know, requires putting a boom lift up into the landing gear, you know, uh, area. Um, but there's some very specific like rules posted now because of this particular incident. Um, it's probably, well, I don't know, monetarily probably the most damage that thing ever sustained. Um, it might be second in like awfulness to the Frappuccino incident on the plane set, but, uh, that's one that I really should get pictures up for. Frappuccino, three main lines of train, 26 locomotives, a bad day. 
And with that, I'm going to leave you all to have a good day. I hope this was interesting. Um, I know we kind of flashed through some things and some, some various applications, but I think it's worth going and playing around, especially to like, as you're, I, one thing piece of feedback that I hear a lot is like, the software stuff is is interesting and cool and I'm, I'm learning it, but I struggle in integrating it with the hardware. Um, and I have a hard time sort of differentiating when it's a software issue versus my hardware issue. So I would say consider bashing yourself together a little T-Kinter shells um, so that you can really easily test your your hardware as you go outside of your main program um, so you can tell like what's uh, what's happening uh, in your hardware outside of your outside of your logic might be a fun thing to do and a good way to like learn this stuff Tkinter is like a, it's a little bit I, I I personally feel it's a little bit unintuitive until you start playing with it so get your hands in there make some simple apps control some things I think it's a good a good thing to do uh, TFOA yeah, yeah. When we can all have beer again. Oh, I have stories. It's I, Nate. It sounds like you have stories. Chris and Palmer. I know you have stories. Yeah, I will. I will cherish that day. I look forward to it in the future. But until that day, good segue. Thank you so much for joining us here on a Sunday night. As always, all the code from tonight will be on Jeff Glass Electronics Bash. If you have questions, comments, issues, concerns, find me at Jeffers Glass on Twitter. Please stay safe out there. Please wash your hands. Wear your mask. Let's beat this thing. Um, and you are all great. I like you so much. And uh, I will be back uh, two Sundays from now to do more uh, nerdy things with Python on the Raspberry Pi. Again, I'm a little bit adrift for what exactly that's going to be. Um, might have something to do. I mean, if it's going to be a thing that's integrated with stuff I'm doing at work, um, it's going to be to do with, well, there's your, there's your bonus tummy cam of the evening. Oh, and of course, now I can't find it. Um, I have been setting up an Andon stack light, which is, uh, for those who don't know, um, one of these guys. One of these little, uh, like you would see in an industrial factory, a little light or set of buzzers that indicates the state of an industrial machine. I have been setting up, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, one of those two um monitor the state of my 3D printer at work and I have that fully working now and it's all running in Python. So that might be an interesting like interactivity study or not. I don't know, but I will see you in two weeks. I may be back next Sunday night for another casual stream, um, but that's of course always TBD. If I do, I'll try and get it scheduled in advance. You were all great. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, uh, uh, send me beer in the mail, um, send cake to your neighbors, send letters to your grandma. You are all great. Um, and I will, uh, I will see you next time. Yeah, Pomodoro time. Yeah, once you have a USB controllable and on, the world is your oyster. That might be a fun thing to do. Um, it involves 3D printing, which, you know, might be a fun thing to talk about as well. Not related, but fun. Anyway, y'all are great. I'll see you next time. Thanks, y'all. Bye.